friends in Dhamma, um, those who practice Dhamma in harmony, and all Kalayana Mita. Through the Vinaya, we are Sahadamika, and we, those who follow Dhamma, who practice Dhamma together, and through the Dhamma, we are Kalayana Mita, or good friends. Let me express my great delight that all of you have come to this place in this way for, for this purpose. We will exchange dham- our knowledge of Dhamma between us and will examine the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha in detail that we have chosen the early morning <clears throat> as a time to speak is due to various reasons. In the early morning before dawn, the mind is still fresh and open. Many flowers open at this time around dawn, and the Buddha was awakened about this time of the day. And for all of us, our teacups have yet to overflow. They haven't gotten filled up yet. As for myself, I've got a little bit of strength at this time. At other times, I'm weak. And please take every minute, every moment as training even the time you spent walking over here or the time you spend returning after the talk, please use every moment as sikha or training. For today, the subject I'd like to talk about is an overview or bird's eye view of Buddhism of Buddha Sasana. This is a general look without much detail into various things we should be aware of. So we will have a body tam, which is to look at things in a from all sides, especially of the the things we call Dhamma sasana, and Buddha. These will be the three things we'll discuss today. And then we'll be able to examine certain other things which are associated with these three words. The first matter to look at is Dhamma or Dharma with the topic of what is Dhamma? In brief, we can say the Dhamma is the law of nature which the Buddha discovered and then then made available or proclaimed to all of us. This word law or goat has two basic, there are two basic kinds. There's the kind of law of nature, which has to do with nature itself, with nature exclusively. And then there's the kind of law which has to do with human beings. The Buddha spoke of both kind of laws. The kind, the second kind which has to do with human beings, this can be taught and it can also be removed. We can set up human laws and we can repeal them. But the law of nature, this can neither be established or repealed even by the Buddha. In Pali, we use the word satcha 
for law, especially the natural law existing free of human beings. As for the laws which the Buddha has established, we call these Vinaya or Vitnaya. You should consider the difference between the words law and rule in this case. In Thai, we have to use the same word goat in both cases, but it's fortunate that in English we can discriminate with the words law and rule. When we talk of law or satcha, this is, there is just one and it's, it's absolute, unchanging. There's a phrase in the, the Pali that says, the truth is one, there is no second. As for the Vinaya, these rules are something which the Buddha can establish and later repeal. Some Buddhas didn't establish any Vinaya at all, and then other Buddhas established a Vinaya which was sufficiently complete. Now we'll examine the Dhamma as the law of nature. When we look into this, we should look, look deeply and consider that which we call the Datu, elements or essences, that things in this world are compounded of, of many, many Datus, which if we look at it along the lines of modern science, comes down to atoms. If we look on the level of atoms, we'll see that in the atom there are, each atom has its, its law, is governed by law. And then when we collect various atoms together, there is still, they're still under the power of their, the law within them. And then when we end up with molecules, or even when many molecules are come together and we have what in Pali is called a datu or element, it is still, all of these are under some law, under their law. And in all cases, this law is fixed and unchanging. When we speak of datus, there are both the physical kind the material kinds, such as which make up our bodies. And then there is the datu, <coughs> which isn't physical, which is immaterial. Nonetheless, all along, the datus, all datus, all elements, are under the law. There's no way it could be otherwise. So when the datus are compounded together, collected together in different ways, then we get all kinds of strange and wonderful things. We, we get these bodies, which are made up of various datus. And there are then mental things, which aren't physical, but are still made up of, of datus. And then there are things, there are things which are alive, and there are things which are without life. But, and we have, but the law applies to all of them. And so there arises that which we call the law of itapa jayata, the law of conditionality. When we're speaking collectively of both material, physical, and mental things, then we call this law itapa jayata. But when we speak only of living things, things with consciousness which can think and experience, then we call the, the law is called paticca samupada. Please remember this and be very clear 
that when we're speaking in general terms about everything, whether material or mental, then we speak of the law of Itapajayata. However, when we're speaking specifically of things which are conscious with minds, whether animals or humans, then we call it the law of Paticca Samupada, or the law of dependent origination. When we're not careful, these words get all confused, and we use them interchangeably, or sometimes even get them reversed and backwards. This happens even in Thailand. It even happens in Sri Lanka, Burma, and Kampuchea, that these important words get confused so that they're often used without any, without any standard or principle. Even in the, the Pali, it's a, bit, it's a bit unclear. When speaking in general terms of all kinds of things, the Buddha used the word e tapajayata. But when speaking of living beings, um, animals capable of experiencing happiness and dukkha, then he, he used the, the term e tapajayata paticca samupato, so he, which is pretty long. And so we commonly cut it down to just paticca samupato. But the Buddha often used the phrase e tapajayata paticca samupato. So even the Pali can be a bit confusing for us if we're not careful. Next we should look at the, the law itself. This law is absolute. It's totally just. It's, it's supreme. This law is what we ought to call God. If we're going to call something God, it's this law that should be, be called God. Because this, but this law is an impersonal God, unlike the, the ordinary gods that are usually talked about. So if anything deserves to be called God, it's this impersonal or non-personal law of nature. The, the God we usually hear about is one that has feelings, emotions, that is conscious and so on. It's a God that can be satisfied or dissatisfied. It's a God that can even get angry, which means this kind of God is under the power of causes and conditions. This kind of God can be concocted. But the law of nature which we're talking about is neither satisfied or dissatisfied, never gets angry. It can't be concocted or conditioned by anything. It's totally above all conditions. So it's only this God of natural law which can be truly absolute and truly just. I have a certain opinion and I request you to, to give it careful consideration. Please don't go around saying that Buddhism has no God. Please don't be of the opinion that there is no God in Buddhism. Because in Buddhism there is this law of nature which is a more supreme God than any other God. It's the most the supreme, the highest God. This impersonal, so we can say that Buddhism has a God, but of course we mean an impersonal God. So to 
to understand that there is a God in Buddhism is in line with the truth. Please, please give this your fullest attention. Westerners generally think that to be a religion there must be a God. And so they, and with, if there's no God is talked about, then they feel that it's not a religion. So many from the West have considered that Buddhism is not a religion, which is totally false and incorrect. But we've got a God that is more than God, and so we have a religion that's more than or beyond religion. Exactly what religion means is something that they're arguing about endlessly. But if we take the literal meaning of the word, it's not so difficult. So for us, let's take religion to be the observance, the observances or practice which binds humanity with the highest thing. If we understand religion in this way, then we see that Buddhism is the supreme religion because it binds humanity with Nibbana, which is the, the highest reality or thing. The Buddha investigated life deeply until discovering this law, saw that this law applied to everything from the smallest atom to when all the atoms come together into a universe or the cosmic system or whatever we call it. So the Buddha searched until discovering this law and then he saw how we could re re depend upon or rely upon this law in order to quench dukkha. From the smallest, lowest, thing to the, the biggest and highest, this law applies to, to everything. And especially when we, when we consider the mental dukkha, the mental pain and suffering of human beings, this law also applies. Animals don't have this problem of mental dukkha but human beings do. And if we wish to solve this problem, then we must rely upon the, the natural law in order to quench the, the mental suffering of human beings. So we must apply this law in, on the highest level to solve this problem. This Law applies to all of our experience and most of all to the arising of dukkha. Dukkha arises according to this, this law. And if dukkha is going to end, to be quenched, it is quenched also according to this law of itapajayata. So whether the arising the arising of dukkha is itapajayata, and the quenching of dukkha is also subject under the power of this law of itapajayata. Therefore, we must understand this law thoroughly. Here we ought to examine a few questions. First, what what caused this law to arise? Second, what exactly is the law itself? Third, who discovered the law? And fourth, who will understand this law and be able to benefit from it, make use of it? Some religions, in a kind of all-encompassing way, call everything God. They say that the one who made the law and the law itself is, is both God. 
but then they speak of God as someone who has likes and dislikes and uses the law accordingly. And so this way of speaking isn't exactly correct to say that, you know, the, God can use the law this way when he's happy and this way when he's displeased. If we look more carefully, more deeply, we can see that there is <clears throat> the law within nature, the law which is inherent in nature, and out of this arises what the law we're talking about. And then the Buddha was the one who discovered this law, and then the Sangha are those who must understand this law and practice it in order to quench dukkha. Some religions say that God established the law of dependent origination. But how, how could that be? How could, how could God establish a law when the law comes out of nature itself? From the, whenever the first Adam existed, the law was inherent in that, in that Adam. So to say that some, per, some person or someone, some personal God or whatever, established this law can't, can't be. The law is coming out of the inherent existence of things, or it's inherent in things, in nature. In fact, we say that the law of Itapa Jayata created God, not the other way around. Due to the law of conditionality, human beings have certain feelings and reactions and experiences, and out of this there arises the concept of God. So the idea of God is created through the law of Itapajayata. They shouldn't take advantage of people or deceive them by saying that God created the law of nature, the law of Itapajayata. It's not very fair or proper to deceive people in this way, saying that law or that God created the law of nature. Since we're speaking of nature, we, we ought to continue and see that nature has four basic aspects or meanings. There are four basic meanings to the word nature. The first is, is nature itself, what in Thai is called tamacha or in Pali is just called Dhamma. Dhamma means nature. Then there is also the law of nature, the natural law in nature, the natural law of nature, which we've been, been talking about. Then there is the duty according to the law of nature. Because of this law, there is an inherent duty that is always, always to be done. And then finally is the fruit or result that comes from doing that duty. So these are the four meanings of nature or of the word Dhamma. Dhamma can be translated as nature, as the natural law, as duty according to or in line with natural law, and the, the fruit, the result of doing that duty. These are the four meanings of Dhamma, or nature. So when the Buddha taught about various things such as the six dhatus, when he talked about the six elements, 
the four physical ones, vijnana, datu, and the space element. He was talking about nature in the first meaning. And then he discovered and taught the law of nature under which all these datus, to which all these datus are subject. And then, which is the second meaning of dhamma. <clears throat> and he taught how to practice. He taught the duty to be done in relationship <clears throat> to all these datus and the natural law. This is what we call duty, the third meaning of dhamma. And then he spoke of, he taught about the results of doing the duty, whether we call it magapala, path in fruition, or nibbana. This, he also taught about the, the results. So the Buddha taught all four aspects of dhamma. He explained all the different meanings within his teachings. If we use the Pali terms, it's concise, straightforward, and clear. First, there is Sabhava Dhamma, which is things, things existing in themselves, or things in themselves. This is the first meaning of nature, Sabhava Dhamma. Then there is Satcha Dhamma, which is truth or the law. Next is Bhati Dhamma, the duty to be practiced. And then last, Bhati Veta Dhamma, the results or fruits of that duty and practice. So we have these four Pali terms which correspond to the four meanings of Dhamma. There's Sabhava Dhamma, Satcha Dhamma, Bhati Bhati Dhamma and Bhati Veta Dhamma. Our duty is to thoroughly understand all four of these meanings. And you should know that all four of these are ourselves. All four of these are found within ourselves. Sabhava Dhamma, nature, things as they are in themselves. This is our body, our minds. The Satcha Dhamma, the law of nature, is right here within ourselves. It's within all this mental, material existence that we call ourselves. The Bhati Dhamma, the duty to be practiced is to be practiced here within ourselves. And the, the Bhati Veta Dhamma, the fruits of that duty of practice, are within us as well. When we practice correctly according to the law of nature, there is sukha, joy and peace. When we practice foolishly, incorrectly, then the result is dukkha, is pain and, and stress. All four meanings of these are within ourselves. We are these, these four aspects of nature. And so we, we can experience them and understand them directly. And then outside of ourselves, all other animals and our human, human comrades, all of them exhibit these, these four meanings. And so we must understand and, and perform our duty correctly regarding these four meanings regarding the natural law, whether within ourselves or outside of ourselves, because the natural law controls, regulates everything, both that which is within us and that which is outside of us. If we teach this law to people, if we teach people so that everyone understands this law, then there won't be any more fighting and killing. Because through understanding this law, everybody will realize that we're friends, we're comrades in birth, aging, illness, and death. 
So by teaching this law to the world, there can be genuine love and understanding in the world. This is true even if we speak in rather strange or humorous ways. Which is, we can say this applies to the entire cosmos. The whole cosmos itself is the sabhavadhamma, is nature. And then all of this cosmos is under the satchadhamma, is under the power of the law of nature. And then all the members of this cosmos must perform their duty, the bhati bhati dhamma, within this cosmos. And then there is either sukha or dukkha, according to how, how the duty is performed. No matter what level we speak on, no matter which cosmos we're talking about, whether this one, the next one, or whichever one, they all are subject to this, the same basic fact, this same law. When we look at Buddhism in this way, we see very clearly that it's scientific. And so then we should be able to teach it to our fellow human beings scientifically especially to the scientists. And by scientists, we mean people who have a scientific attitude, who have a spirit of investigation and honesty, who can go into things in a reasonable way. If we can express Buddhism in this way, people, intelligent people, will be able to understand it and put it into practice. This is the only way also that will work. If we, Buddhism must be presented as science, as the, the highest science. It's not just a, a material science, but it's a total science of all aspects of, of life. We must approach Buddhism in this way. If we approach it as a philosophy or something, it won't do us much good. So we must understand it and teach it scientifically. So this, this word tam in Thai or Dhamma in Pali or Dharma in Sanskrit it turns out to be a truly wonderful world, word. It has these various meanings, it's very profound, and it encompasses the, the entire cosmos. It's a word that's so marvelous that it can't really be translated into other languages. In Thai, they don't even try, they just pronounce it Tam. But in other there have been people who've been trying to translate it into English, and so far they've come up with 38 different attempts to translate the word Dhamma, and they still haven't, they still haven't got it all. So it's best just to use the word Dhamma or Dharma, and to introduce this into English and the other languages of the world because it's a truly wonderful word. So all of this has been a bird's eye view of the word Dhamma in response to the question, what is Dhamma? And in short, the answer is these various things about nature which we have been discussing. And now we'll speak about the second topic, about the word sasana. What is sasana? The most brief and correct definition for the word sasana is simply the method or way of getting out of dukkha. Sasana means the way of getting free of dukkha. 
the way of getting out from dukkha is needed by all living things. All, all beings which have, <coughs> which have life need a way to escape from dukkha. This is called sasana. So all living things require sasana. If we look, we'll observe that all living things, everything without all living beings, have their way of escaping from dukkha. This applies to all living things, without exception. Crabs and rats have their way of escaping into their holes to avoid danger. Birds escape by flying up into the sky. Other animals can run and flee from the danger. If we look honestly, we must accept that all animals have their sasana, their means of escaping from dukkha. These are the examples of the sasana of, of animals. We have an instinct to be afraid of death, to be afraid of danger and, and death. This basic instinct, the, the instinct to, of flight or the survival instinct is the foundation of sasana or religion. All sasana, there wouldn't be any sasana if it wasn't for this survival instinct in all of us. Animal, there are both, men, there's both physical suffering and mental suffering. Animals have the advantage because they only have the physical suffering and so they can deal with it rather easily. Human beings, however, also have all this these very complicated and profound minds. And so there's also very complicated and profound mental dukkha for human beings. And for this reason, we're unable to escape from dukkha completely. Animals are luckier than us because they only have to deal with physical dukkha. Human beings have all kinds of mental dukkha and we haven't been able to solve it to this day. We still have all kinds of problems and conflicts and everything. So there's both physical dukkha and mental dukkha. And sasana is the, the way to, to deal with these various kinds of dukkha. Don't don't say that animals don't have their sasana. They do. All animals have some form of sasana to deal with their physical dukkha. And then this is the, also the foundation for human sasana when we attempt to deal with our mental dukkha. Now we're we're having the problem that we don't understand sasana sufficiently. Both the humans and the devas don't know sasana or understand the sasana enough to get free of dukkha. So whether we're devas or humans or whatever, we must study this sasana until we can, we can quench dukkha completely. Some sasana are just a bunch of ceremonies and rituals. And how that is going to quench dukkha we, we don't really understand. Other, other sasana leave everything to God and end up being something like just a way of trying to flatter God. So exactly what sasana is, is something we should look at very carefully. Our, the first people who appeared, our primitive ancestors, had their 
little rituals and ceremonies, they had their superstitions. This is what made up the, the first religion. And these superstitions continue even, even today. So we need to be very careful to understand what is truly sasana. We need to avoid all these superstitions which even now exist. To discriminate superstition from sasana is, is quite simple if we take the Pali as our, our standard. It's often very clear. So the word superstition or sayasat comes from the word saya, which is to sleep. Sat means knowledge or science, like in the English, the Greek suffix ology. So, sayasat is the science of sleepers or sleepology. It's the knowledge of those who are asleep. Putasat is, puta means to be awake, to be awakened. So, putasat is the knowledge or science of those who are awake. Sayasat is the science or sasana of sleepers and putasat is the science or sasana of those who are awake. If we go to the Pali, it, the, diff, the distinction is clear. Now all of us are, are following the Buddha sasana or putasat. And so it's quite clear that we're following the, the religion or science of the awakened one. And then we must make ourselves fit to be awake. We, should, we shouldn't sleep. We, we shouldn't let ourselves sleep in, in superstition. But one difficulty is that Sayasat appeared before Puttasat. Before there was the Buddha Sasana, there were there was plenty of Sayasat. And then once there appeared the Buddha Sat or Buddha Sasana, there the, all the people who couldn't understand it then changed it and adjusted it to be superstition. And so this continues even today that a lot of so-called Buddhism has really been turned into superstition by the people who are unable to understand the science of the, the awakened ones. So we must be very careful about this confusion because even today things are quite mixed up and messed up whether in America, Europe, or Asia, Sayasat appeared first. All of us, all human beings, are born lacking, lacking wisdom. And so, Sayasat, or superstition, must appear first in, in each of our lives and in each of our cultures. Until one day we meet up with something higher with Puttasat, with Buddhism. But even so, Sayasat and Puttasat are still, still mixed up together. So we need to be very careful. Even in the West, they're, they're mixed up. Supposedly these scientific Western cultures are still quite um, confused with superstition. For example, when all kinds of modern technology and science is used to build a ship, they still have to, before they launch the ship, they still have to break the bottle of champagne on its bow for absolutely no purpose. They waste a good bottle of champagne. And so even, even nowadays, Sayasat is mixed up with, with science. A simple 
principle for telling Sayasat apart from Puttasat is that superstition is to depend on others. Superstition is to put, to rely upon things outside of oneself. Whereas Buddhism means to rely on oneself, to rely on things within oneself. Sayasat is, is based in faith, in believing things. Whereas Puttasat is based in intelligence, in, in wisdom. Sayasat is just blind faith and Buddhism is the approach of wisdom. For Buddhists to rely upon, to seek help from P, from spirits, ghosts, from the devas, even from the biggest deva of them all, God, to seek any help or to depend on any of them or anything on anything outside of oneself, Buddhists should understand that all of this is superstition. Except those who, who rely upon God, if they change the meaning of God so that to make it correct, so that it means the impersonal law of nature, then that is an exception, that if they understand God in the right way, then that is not sayasa. Therefore, our sasana is put Buddha sa or Buddha sasana. Don't let any sayasa get mixed up with it. Don't let any of it in. There's something kind of amusing or even kind of joke or pun in the in the Pali. The word saya lewa dikwa. Dikwa, dikwa The word saya besides meaning to sleep can also mean better than nothing. So so Sayasat or superstition is better than nothing. So the the people living in the woods or the primitives long ago or even now, they they have their so called superstitions which are ne necessary for them to survive. And this is of course better than nothing. The aim of Buddhism is to destroy sayasa or superstition. If you reflect upon the what is called Silapata Paramasa, one of the first fetters, its meaning is is the same as superstition or sayasa. And the point of and Buddhism seeks to free us from such fetters. Silapata Paramat means to understand or practice Dhamma in a way that is incorrect according to that Dhamma's meaning. So to take some Dhamma or teaching and to understand it and practice it incorrectly. This is a fetter or san Sanyochana which we must abandon, which we must get free of, if in order to realize sotapanahood or stream entry. For example, dana, dana or tan, giving or alms, charity, has the, the meaning of it or the purpose of it is to decrease selfishness. But people are giving dana instead to as kind of an exchange in order to buy heaven or buy paradise. So this is to to practice dana foolishly, to turn dana into a superstition. Or take sila. The purpose of sila is to 
to get free of selfishness. But there are people who keep sila in order to think that they're better to, uh, than others, in order to judge others, or in order to brag or boast about themselves, which is to turn sila into superstition. It's to practice it for the wrong reasons. So even sila can be turned into silapata paramasa. Or samadhi, meditation, has the purpose of getting rid of or controlling selfishness. But there are people who practice samadhi in order to be somebody really special or to have magic powers or something. And so they turn samadhi into silapata paramasa. Or panya and vipassana have the sole purpose of cutting the roots of selfishness, of removing the cause, all the causes of selfishness. But then there are people who practice, who develop wisdom, who practice <coughs> vipassana in order to be a sage or in order to be a teacher or something like this. And so even vipassana can become silapata paramasa without one knowing it. Thus, if we ask what is sasana, we can say sasana is the tool for getting rid of all forms and levels of selfishness. And nowadays the world is about to, to go to hell because of selfishness. The capitalists are selfish, the laborers are selfish, the owners are selfish, or the employees are, the employers are selfish, the employees are selfish, the government is selfish, the congresses, the parliaments are selfish. The world is going to ruin because of, because of selfishness. The UN for example, is a meeting place where people argue about their own selfish interests. It's a place for arguing and competing and dividing up the pies. And so the UN is never really able to solve any of the world's problems because it ends up being just a big meeting place of selfishness. We ought to end the UN and put a UR in its place. Instead of the United Nations, we should have a United Religion, which ought to be more successful in ending selfishness. Or if we, we can't get rid of the UN, we should at least have a UR to supervise the UN and make sure it, it behaves properly. All religions aim to and selfishness, but religions are on various levels to suit the different needs and abilities of people or the different levels of, of understanding. Buddhism or Puttasat is aims to eliminate or to free us from the self, the soul, the atta or atman, whatever we call it, and then selfishness goes away by itself which is the easiest approach. It's a pretty easy way of going about it. This is how Buddhism ends selfishness. Other religions do it in other ways suitable for different people. Religions which really stress that there is a self or a soul which emphasize this and make it a firm belief, it's very, very difficult for these religions to to end selfishness. So all of this is a, an answer to the question, what is sasana? So in short, sasana is the way of getting out of dukkha. All, all animals, whether human or non-human, have sasana or require sasana. And so we should have sympathy and pity for the, the animals because they have their sasana to get out of dukkha, and we should not harm them or destroy them, but rather ought to have 
pity for them. There remains one more word, the word Buddha. Please endure a little longer so that we can finish all three in one, in one sitting. The next word is, is Buddha. Our question then is, what is Buddha? This is a very important question for us. Do we have the real Buddha? Yes. Do we understand Buddha truly, correctly, or, or not? This is an important question for us, so please listen carefully and examine this question deeply. The Buddha himself said that he, one who sees the Dhamma sees me. Whoever sees me sees the Dhamma. Even if you're grabbing onto my robes, that doesn't mean you see me. So there are two Buddhas. There's the, the physical bodily Buddha, and then there's some other Buddha. Elsewhere, he said, whoever sees the Dhamma sees Paticca Samukbhat. Whoever sees Paticca Samukbhat sees the Dhamma. Therefore, to see Paticca Samupada, or dependent origination, is the same as seeing Dhamma, which is the same as seeing the Buddha. So to see the, to see the Buddha means one must see dependent origination. Paticca Samupada is the, the conditions or symptoms of the arising of dukkha and then the symptoms or the conditions of the quenching of dukkha. That dukkha arises dependent on these conditions and then dukkha quenches dependent on these conditions. This is what dependent origination is about, which is the, the natural law which we were talking about at the beginning. Thus, anything that shows or demonstrates dependent origination to us, that thing is the Buddha in, in this meaning. To see dependent origination is to see the Dhamma, is to see the Buddha. So the Buddha is whatever demonstrates or points out Paticca Samuppada to us. Prince Siddhartha is a historical person who was born in India in a certain place to a certain family, had a certain personal history and life. This other Buddha is outside of history, is beyond history, is a non-historical Buddha. The one Buddha, the his the personal historical Buddha was born, awakened, and died. But the other Buddha was never born, never awoke, and never died. So there are two Buddhas. There's the Buddha within history and the Buddha outside of history. Excuse us for saying so, but most Farang are only interested in the historical Buddha. Um, forgive us, it's a little bit rude to point out, but it seems most of the, the Westerners, the Farang, only care about the historical Buddha and don't show any interest in the non-historical Buddha. All the books written in the West about the Buddha are exclusively about the historical Buddha. And so none of you have a chance to know about the, the real Buddha, the one that's outside of history. That historical Buddha was born, died, and all that. But the real Buddha was never born, never awakened, and never died. It's the Buddha that's always, always here. But nobody knows about this Buddha. Or to make it simpler and easier to, to listen to, we can say that there is the Buddha that is the law of nature, 
there is the Buddha, which is the law of nature, and there is the Buddha who pointed out, who told us, who tells us about the law of nature. So there are two Buddhas, the Buddha, which is the law of nature, and the Buddha, which talks about, which tells about the law of nature. Which one of these do you regard as the Buddha? Which one of these is, is your Buddha? One Buddha is eternal. <clears throat> the other Buddha is temporary or temporal. There is only w this second Buddha is born and dies, and there have been many of them. But the other Buddha is, is only one. So there is the one, the, the Buddha which is one, which is eternal. And then there are the many temporal, temporary Buddhas. Which is the one that you think about? Next we must ask, how do we practice regarding the Buddha? If you study the Kalama Sutta carefully and deeply, you'll see that we must not believe even the Buddha himself. We must not believe the words, the teaching of the Buddha. We shouldn't even trust, we, excuse me, we shouldn't even believe the Tipitika. If the ninth item in the Kalama Sutta says, don't believe someone just because they're a believable person, just because they look and sound like someone you can trust. The tenth item is, don't believe someone just because they're my teacher. So even our own teacher, the Buddha, we should not believe. And another one is, don't believe something just because it's written down in a pitaka, in a book or a text. So it's quite clear that we shouldn't just believe in the teachings of the Buddha or in the personal Buddha himself or the, the, any of these books. Instead, we should believe only in the non-historical Buddha, the, the law of nature itself. The only thing we can really put our faith in is the law of nature. So instead of the historical Buddha, believe in the non-historical Buddha. All of, all of the historical Buddha's teachings have the display or point to the other Buddha. But if we believe, if we believe what the historical Buddha says, then we won't be able to see the other Buddha. If we immediately believe what the Buddha says, then we won't be able to see the law of nature. So be very careful. So don't believe in the, the historical Buddha. Don't believe his words. Don't, there's no, don't believe the collection of the words in teaching. Instead, believe only in the reasoning, the reasoning, the, the, and the law of nature which is contained within the Buddha's teaching. Don't, don't believe in the, the temporal Buddha, his words or his teaching, but believe only in the law of nature which is the reasoning contained in the temporal Buddha's teaching. So the real Buddha, the eternal Buddha, can be found within the teachings of the Buddha. But we can only find it if we don't believe in the Buddha and his teachings, the temporal Buddha and his teachings themselves. If we believe in the words, then we get stuck in those words. If we believe in the speaker, then we get stuck on that speaker. If we believe in the holy books, we get stuck 
in those in those in the Tipitika in those in those books. But if we don't believe in these things, then we're free and we can see the the real Buddha, the eternal Buddha. In the the temporal Buddha, his teachings and the collection of his teachings, in his in his speech and the collection of his teachings, all of these are pointing to the eternal non-historical Buddha. But we must be careful not to believe in them. One one of these Buddhas is is true. The other Buddha is is not true. So we must be careful to to find the the right Buddha, the the true one. The there is the eternal Buddha, which is always true. And then there is the temporal Buddha. In all the teachings of the in the true teachings of the temporal Buddha, there are three qualities. First, there is something new that we've never heard before, namely the total quenching of dukkha. Second is a reasoning that shows that the that dukkha can be quenched. And third is a clear way that of how to quench the dukkha. So all the the genuine teachings of the temporal Buddha have these three qualities of being something new, never before heard, of, of having a reasoning of depending on the law of, of nature, and of pointing to a clear way of practicing, to a path in order to quench dukkha. So within the temporal Buddha's teaching can be found the true Buddha, as fits with the words, he who sees the Dhamma sees me, he who sees me sees the Dhamma. So thank you to everyone for being very good and patient listeners, and thank you once again. <laughs>